Good morning, lovely to see you all. I'm so sorry, I had to put a notice up on my Facebook page to say that I would only come on at quarter past 10, but I think I've managed to come on five minutes earlier than that. So we're just gonna wait for um, more people to come online. Good morning, Penny, lovely to see you. And as I say, I was just running a bit late, but here I am, um, a busy household of children that are homeschooling and not that it's their problem at all. So here we are. Good morning, May, lovely to see you. I hope everybody's well. Good morning, Judith from Dublin, lovely to see you. And, uh, Cheryl Harris, thank you for that word that you sent me, very precious. Um, who else? Kim, hi Felt, Gerda, good morning. Ellie, <laughs> Rhonda says just in time. Graham Lewis, good to see you. Isn't it funny, hey, when we have a time constraint, huh? everything takes longer and it's just crazy, but here we are. And uh, Shirley's saying good morning to everybody else online as well. Elizabeth, good to see you. Um, Elizabeth, I think we prayed for you for uh, uh, to strengthen your health. Hope it's going well. Good morning, John. Good to see you online as usual. Um, blessings to you and to Lynn. Benita David, so nice to have you. Avril Murphy, Jenny Hardesty, good morning, good morning. We we'll just wait for a few more to hop on. Hello, Sharon. Lovely to see you. Hope you're feeling a whole lot better. Um, you might remember we prayed for Sharon, and it turned out that she had some food poisoning. Um, and praise God, she says she's much better. Uh, Heidi Faree, lovely to see you. Maureen, so good to see you. It's a beautiful, beautiful day. John says good morning to everyone online. So. I'm so great when I see you greeting one another. Somebody that uh, can't come on every day said to me when she was on the other day, she said, wow, the group has really begun to bond in an amazing way, look after one another, pray for one another. And they thought that was marvelous. I think my dog's trying to come in. Um, Pamela Lloyd, nice to see you. How's it going there in the UK? I think uh, we are enjoying the summer that you are meant to be having, even though we're in the middle of winter. Uh, yes, Cheryl says, a uh, beautiful day in Scotland as well. That's good. Leah Rattle, that's great. Good morning, my friend. Oh, thanks, Avril. And um, Avril is also um, a very good friend with Magilly, um, who's moved to, uh, to, to uh, Dublin. Um, thank you, Leah. She says, good morning, precious Rose. Hello, Hilary. Nice to see you. Yes, um, Maria Coleman, how's your online business going? I hope it is prospering and growing from strength to strength. And Kim says, it's so wonderful and blessed to have one another all over the world. That is so true. Hi, McGilly. I was just saying now, you're a very good friend of Avril's and it's good to see you online. And, uh, oh, hello, Tracy. Lovely to see you. And George Smith. You know, George Smith, I've known him from a little boy and uh, he's not a little boy anymore. He's a man and um, he is a, a stand-up comedian amazing and a lover of God and he's running a youth ministry in uh, in and around Cape Town so so welcome Kirsten and Heather Starbucks lovely to see you Heather hope you're enjoying your painting um, I have the painting that I did last night but maybe I'll keep it until later on. We just want to get everybody on board. 38 of you. Don't forget to share uh, so that, I, I am amazed at how far the word goes out. I have people contacting me on Messenger to say their friend sent it on to them and 
Yeah, it's amazing. Thank you for the way the word is being um, shared. One often feels like, what difference will this word make? Uh, lovely to see you, Enna. Um, and the whole thing is about obedience. If the Holy Spirit prompts us to speak, then we must speak. And also that we keep the word ever before us. Good morning, Joe. And so we just keep putting out the word. And it's so wonderful to see the progress, the progression of the message that is coming forth. And so yesterday we covered how the fivefold ministry as in the office of the apostle, the prophet, the teacher, the evangelist, the pastor, how little by little after the formation of the start in the book of Acts, um, how as the church became more institutionalized, so they only pick out what they want and a lot of those things went into deep filing, put on ice. Good morning, Beulah. How are you? Beulah came to all the ladies' meetings at Fishhook and she's moved to, moved to Durban and now she's nearer her family and gets help with her husband who's not been well. And it's lovely when we connect, Beulah. I know how hungry you are for fellowship and for the word. <laughs> Chase, it's uh, Heidi Steiger, good to see you. And Chase, good to see you. I think both Heidi and Chase have both gone back to work. Two different people, one living in the southern suburbs, one living all the way in the northern suburbs. But I know, as far as I know, both of you have uh, gone back to work. Um, thank you for um, coming online, Pastor Gray Berry, special man of God ministering out there near Bloberg area and always lovely you're so encouraging and so lovely to have you so yesterday we looked at the fivefold ministry which had gone into the deep freeze over the years as the institutionalized church um it said prophets were in for today apostles there's no more apostles with capital A. There's only the 12 and no man dared to add to the apostolic and uh, crazy, eh? Hey? So crazy. Uh, so both Chais and Heidi say, yeah, working from their desks. Chais <laughs> uh, put up a picture of an amazing car on his Facebook page. And I'm a car person. I love cars. Um, my family, as the men in my family, come from car backgrounds and motor racing and off-road bike racing. And I saw this car and I said, what is it? <laughs> Beautiful. But yes, I hold myself together and I drive a very conservative polo classic. But uh, if I had my way... It would be something different every day. A Monday car, a Tuesday car, a Wednesday car, a Thursday car, a Friday car, a Saturday car, and a Merc for a Sunday. Because all pastors that look respectable drive Merc. <laughs> I hope that some of you who don't know me well understand my sense of humor. And don't go and say, oh my goodness, she is um, into prosperity. A car for every day of the week. <laughs> no. I have a wicked sense of um, a sense of humor. I mean, you'll get used to me. <laughs> Good morning, Raynal. Lovely to see you. So then we saw from yesterday that um, through the through the years, through the years, um, seven sixties, seventies, we saw these gifts reinstated. And um, the teacher came back and everybody took their Bible and their pens and paper to church and wrote down every single word that the person said. You know, when you were ministering during the reinstating of the ministry of the teacher, um, we never even looked up. If I was ministering, heads were down and you would just say, wow, oh my gosh. And so you knew they were still there. But um, they just 
were heads down, you know, taking in every word, eating it, walking around with their notebook, referring to it. And then, uh, then we saw uh, the whole movement of the evangelist and big tents and Rhino Bonker and Africa for Jesus and Cape to Cairo. And yeah, we were all just like, yeah, let's go, let's go. And um, it was amazing. So we did that. And then uh, after that, after the evangelist, then suddenly the church didn't want the evangelist anymore. Uh, we went like, mm -mm, we don't want the evangelist. They got ball bearings under their feet. A, a rolling stone gathers no moss. <laughs> they just want to get in numbers, but they never disciple the people of God. What use is that? So critical, weren't we? And um, we even had prescriptive things that if you're an evangelist, we, you need to come to church and you need to be grounded and we, and oh, terrible, isn't it? And then, John, it must be on your side because my uh, signal is pretty clear here today. And then um, after that, after the, the evangelist, we got the prophets coming on board. And, and it was quite problematic when the prophets came back on board because some of them were still operating out of, good morning, Sean, good to see you. Some of the prophets that came back when the, the fivefold ministry was beginning to be reestablished, it was a crazy season because some of the prophets used to bring these promises with these and thou's. Thy God loveth thee. And um, they felt that if they punctuated it with all these and thou's, it made it authoritative, but they don't understand that that is King James language. It doesn't mean that that's what God speaks anyhow. And so the prophets were handed back into the mix of the fivefold ministry and gung ho everybody we used to go to meetings with these boxes of tapes and little tape recorders and sometimes two machines and then you you prophesy and you give it to your assistant and they give you a, a new machine with a fresh tape in it and the one that she took out your hand she takes it out puts the person's name and gives it to them 20 rand they had to pay for the tape or 10 rand i can't remember now and so we were like these little well-worn machines, up to 200 people in the morning, prophesy, prophesy, prophesy. We were the first to arrive at church and the last to leave the party. And then, of course, the, now there's a groundswell of the prophetic, and then there's uh, the critical, uh, criticalness comes. And, um, and it comes mainly around jealousy. They go, Everybody comes because you're a prophet. If we say we're ministering, nobody comes because people are just running after prophetic words. And, and so then as prophets, you start to pull back and you don't know where you fit in. And, and, um, and if you're a household prophet, in other words, you're only prophesying to your group and you're not traveling. I mean, how many times can you give a person a word of encouragement? And then how God is so faithful. And then uh, in the last um, 20 years, the apostolic came in. And the apostolic had its own pendulum, good, bad, and ugly. And, and now I believe God is reinstating and has reinstated the apostolic and the prophetic together. It's very powerful. It's not only for the establishing of the church, but it's to bring the church to uh, a place of beautification uh, and preparing a bride. And these are, are uh, not the gift. I mean, the gift is amazing anyhow. But apostle is, is an office. It's an office. And the prophetic is an office and a gift. But, the, but I also want to say that apostolic is also, even though it's an office, you can also run in an apostolic atmosphere, which is a gift. And even though it's not listed in the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. But if I send you on my behalf to go and minister somewhere and I lay hands on you and I say, I send you with an apostolic anointing, the word apostle means one that is sent. And we need to demystify these things. You know, in um, Malachi, it actually says, 
that uh, the hearts of the fathers will be turned to the sons and the hearts of the sons will be turned to the fathers. And so we can see that there is a lack. And when I say fathers, it's not a gender thing. Because we have women that run whole households and have to father and mother. And so when I say the hearts of the fathers return to the sons and the hearts of the sons return to the fathers, I'm talking about um, a nurturing, a fathering, a nurturing, a leading, an establishing, um, anointing. And an anointing that brings many sons to glory. You really are the glory of the Lord, but the apostolic anointing coupled with the prophetic, the prophetic unveils the promise and the apostolic brings it into um, a place of placement. Oh, I nearly fell off my chair. <laughs> a place of placement. And so they are two very important parts of the church, but what has happened is the church has become so institutionalized that Many people have walked away and many people can't relate. They relate to Jesus and they relate to the Trinity and they relate to gifting and they relate to charisma. And, um, but they, they um, don't relate to the institution of the church. And so when we were... Uh, charismatics, we would go, oh, we don't agree with denominations. But let me tell you, the moves that we are in have become as stagnant because we have set ways around the Holy Spirit. We have set things that we do with the Holy Spirit. And we have set um, uh, rules of conduct in those meetings. Some of it is very necessary, as I expounded once before. <laughs> once before, I expounded on this, that we had these very satanic people coming into the church. And um, I want to tell you there's no unity in the satanic movement. It's operated out of mockery and hate. And they come into the meetings, they bring with them disunity, and hate and we've had and i don't want to major on this but i'm going to just say this once and we're going to move on we've had people come in and pose lionel straight from from the floor and so when i speak about the church became very institutionalized it wasn't without good reason <laughs> there were times that you had to have strict things in place because of the um the level of what was going down. Also, what about culture? This morning when I was getting ready, I was thinking about the difference in personality and culture and how we live through uh, our personality and we judge others by our personality and how they should respond. So, um, uh, so talking about culture, Genuine, born again, filled with the Spirit. We're doing a ladies' meeting. And you start to pray with a lady that comes out of a certain culture. And they are extremely emotional. And, oh, 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 oh. and you have to send somebody over there to say, why don't you just put your arm around that person and just love on them. Because otherwise... It will be so chaotic. It's not because it's wrong. It's because of cultural differences. And um, But God's order and our order is very different. And, and so you'll see a thinning out of the church right now. People that are online, like we are online and going, this is what I want. I want, you might be saying this, I want a personal relationship with Jesus. I want to live my life according to the word of God. But I want to choose. Because the church became a place that there was no personal boundaries. Everybody can give you a word. Everybody can tell you what to do. Everybody will even say to you, I love you, but. 
and uh, it chased people away. We come from different backgrounds, different cultures, but we need to adopt the culture of heaven. But the culture of heaven isn't Father Christmas and you press these buttons. Neither is God a grandfather. He's a father. Hmm? <laughs> so, there's a lot of things that are being weighed up at this time. And uh, it's not that what has come before is, is wrong. It's just redundant. It's redundant. The cloud is moving. And so this father and son thing that has come, not that it's new. There have been father and son movements over many, many different decades. And it also went very wrong. Because remember what I said, when a new truth comes, the pendulum first starts on the extreme side where everybody hates it. Then it goes on, no, we're not having it. We're sick of it. And then we have an authentic place. Uh, Teresa has to go, struggling with the internet. Oh, that's terrible. Okay, so then you'll watch later. God bless you, Teresa. We love you. And yes, we need to adopt the culture of heaven. And, but then if you adopt the culture of heaven, then make, you need to be, you need to hear God. Don't, you cannot baptize everything that God told me, God said, God, because we can do anything by putting that on the end. So what is this new end time move? Well, we looked at it quite extensively and said, it is the apostolic and the prophetic. It's an end time anointing. Now you will get people that all run, uh, streams of them that run with fathers and sons, even as they ran with home churches. Then you'll get everybody, no, we finished with fathers and sons. We are running with kingdom teaching, kingdom teaching that the kingdoms of our God, of this world become the kingdom of our God. The kingdom of God is within us. The kingdom is where we work. We use where we go. The kingdom goes with us. And some people go, I'm sick of this kingdom thing, because that also had its extremes. Kingdom now and dominion. And we own the earth and buy your house now, because you're going to live in it forever. And there's no such thing as the rapture. And Jesus is taking out the wicked and the, whoops, and the righteous is staying on the earth. You have to know that a, a, a loving God is one thing. And studying doctrine, it says too much studying. Where is a man? And it can puff you up that you have the squeaky clean doctrine. The only thing that qualifies us is the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. And then, obviously, we walk in spirit and in truth. And Jesus is truth. And Holy Spirit is a teacher and a guide. And a comforter, what does he comfort you from? He doesn't only comfort you in a place of grieving. He comforts you when you feel rejected. He comforts you when you're outside of the status quo. He comforts you when you're pioneering and you have nobody on the left and nobody on the right. We, we, it's wonderful if you are Paul and Timothy. It's wonderful if you are David and Jonathan. But it's problematic if you are David and Saul. It's problematic if you are Paul and Peter. Not many would, uh, uh, would have been attracted to Peter's forthrightness. And so we uh, need to let God appoint how this thing looks going forward. Otherwise, we will pick people with the same personality. I remember at one time... Um, I used to say to Lionel, I say, I'm sorry, I don't agree with what we are discussing. I don't agree. And I say, I want it noted in the leaders meeting that I don't agree. I'm not saying I'm not going with it, but I want it noted that I don't agree. Because all of these people are your brews. <laughs> I was a cheeky thing, you know. I would say, no. Because at the end of the whole discussion, they would say, but pastor, what do you feel? You know, because he was leading, they would default or 
uh, lean to what he wants, which is not a bad thing. Don't get me wrong. It's called honor. But I, being prophetic, would challenge a thing if I had a check in my spirit. It didn't mean I got my own way, but I certainly wanted to add. Everything that you add has value. Everything that you add has value. Because uh, of serving God, worshipping God, being part of his kingdom is family. And if families don't talk, then the family isn't a family. Hmm? And uh, Elmin's just brought up Danny Silk's book, Culture of Honor, is a good book. Uh, and one thing that stood out was if the apostolic and prophetic is... Come, let me open it here a bit. Uh, uh, is not honored or it is not there then you need to know you're in the wrong place you need to be in a place where the apostles and prophets are honored now that is so interesting i mean because it was last night as i was finished painting and i was looking what lives have come up on my list of lives that you know you can subscribe to and danny and his wife i can't remember her name now and they were about to speak, um, we must go and look. They were about to speak around his book, The Culture of Honor. And she said, I want you to know that it's not about honoring and keeping peace. That this culture of honor will bring lively interaction. And I understand because it's based around honoring apostles and prophets. And there will be streams that will go at last and sherry thank you um shirley and so sherry salt was saying it's not about it's not about um peace because people have taken the book and they honor everything everything oh but you can't you can't judge that no you can't speak about that we've got to live from a culture of honor so even if a, a thing is wrong and in your discernment, you know this thing isn't right. right. Oh, just honor them. Honor the, those that are older than you. Honor those that are mothers and fathers amongst you. Honor. But what if, what if that person is doing something blatantly rebellious because they are, hey, but you have to honor me. I'm older. Position's got nothing to do with age. Nothing. There are people older than me that will still still consider me a mother, a spiritual mother. And uh, and so um, at the end of the day, it's not about whether we accept this doctrine or that doctrine. It's about moving the church from institution to a place of relativity as family and house. We are the house of God. We are the family of God. We are the body of Christ. And uh, staying in, that, in those buildings has made us irrelevant. Irrelevant. The church has left the building is exactly where we are at exactly where we are at and these are hard conversations that we are having on today hard conversations because we are going to have huge streams of people that are going to just do church as usual and then those that have decided they're not doing church as usual are going to be marked as the rebels and they're going to ask, who are your fathers? Well, fathers and mothers are relational. They are not documents. It's not documentation. It's not legislation. It's relational. The other day on the live, uh, a friend of mine said she has a spiritual father because she is um, single. And instead of responding, I reacted because of my history. And I said, um, I, I don't agree with that. My son's in my house, meaning my two physical son, blood sons are my, my covering. 
or my my watchman and she and I dialogued it afterwards and she is she was so right she was so right she said no it's more mentors she has mentors in her life because um, there are some things that she needs to hear from a father but it's not a prescriptive thing she has advisors and mentors that have walked with God many years and she trusts I said yes I agree completely and and then she said, remember what you said, Rose, about these few people, men at church. I said, that's right. I have one that offered to be my armor bearer. I have my two physical sons. And then I have a long standing couple, but particularly the man who has been with us on and off, on and off for the, when our children were growing up that I would feel very comfortable to ask his advice. And my son-in-law, also a man of great wisdom. And so, I, but I don't believe that every single woman has to go find a spiritual father. They're part of the family of God and there will be fathers amongst us. Because otherwise that thing's going to morph into something of a monster. A monster. That everybody's got to go out. And who's going to share whose husband? Do you know what I'm saying? This man is so honorable. I want him to be my spiritual father. And he's got his own household. So what looks good now can become a total monster. And so we have mothers and fathers amongst us. And this is making myself extremely vulnerable. But if I wasn't leading a church, I'd be very picky who I sat under as a spiritual father. I must be honest. Very honest. I've seen different models of fathering and the men that have no identity issues that are fathers because they fathers because they fathers because they fathers because they have wisdom because they have weight because they're not bosses because they're not tyrants because they they're kind but they have wisdom that's the father i probably won't choose the father with the the aeroplane and the caduce suit and the and the um, snakeskin shoes and that can only see me um, uh, maybe once in a year. You see, that's not to me. That's not a father. Anyhow, I need to move on because <laughs> I think I opened a bit of a can of worms. <laughs> what I'm saying is, don't take a doctrine or a teaching and try and follow it that looks good here at the end of the day is going to be a disaster lead us oh god and the word does say that you have well, you have many teachers but there are not many fathers Yeah, I'm not about to reveal the name on, on this, but I have watched a particular father in a group discussion that will, does not shoot his mouth off, but will wait patiently. And when he answers, he will answer what the word says, and it will not be um, cutting it will not attack what somebody else believes and you just feel the wisdom of God arrive in the room and he, this particular father is part of that order that I spoke about many years ago that were trained between a rock and a hard place that were not recognized in the South African culture at all. 
a man of caliber that just consistently loved God, pushed in, pushed in, pushed in. For promotion does not come from man. It comes from God. So that's that. We didn't even open in prayer because we were, were the, I was on my starting blocks when I sat down and just took off. Hmm. Let me see my reading glasses. Are you still with me? <laughs> yes, I agree with you, Anna. Very rare. Oh, this is Genesis 37, verse 19, on Joseph. Then they said to one another, this is the brothers, Look, this dreamer is coming. Come let, therefore, let us now kill him. And cast him into some pit, any pit, eh? some pit. And we shall say, some wild animals have devoured him. Murder lies and conspiracy conspiracy and we shall see what becomes of his dream hey you've been not only hearing of wars and rumors of wars you have been in the wars if anybody when you prayed the sinner's prayer, said to you, now you're coming to the best place in your life. It was just the beginning. The, everything's done. The blood has covered everything. You have a new identity, new DNA, do, and, and on and on and on. But if you want to understand maturity, it takes a process. A process. That's not only in the kingdom of God. That's just in general. So this morning getting ready, I was thinking about personality type. And I thought, yeah, I'm sure this isn't new. I'm sure this has already been done. But if we start to study what we feel Paul's personality type is against Peter's personality type, against John's personality type, we would have three different personality types. And if I said to you, you need to choose the model, if whether you're going to be under John and not John the Baptist, the disciple John, uh, that lent on Jesus at the Last Supper. Are you going to be with John? Are you going to be with Paul? Or are you going to be with Peter? The evangelist and the, and the prophetic speakers, they're going to all run to Peter. The learned and the, the teachers and those that mind the word are all going to go with Paul. And those that are feely touchy are all going to go with John. And all three of them were impeccably loved God, passionately built the kingdom. But their outworking was totally, totally different. Just because the thing is different doesn't make it wrong. But let's say you're a Peter. Peter was quick and out there before he'd even thought about a thing and so his personality type was up front see the see what's wrong and address it and see what's right and build it and for a whole lot of you online this morning you will go that's what i like that's me that's me then you have the pauls much more intellectual studied under gamil uh had words upon words, my husband, my husband. <laughs> and he had men and women that loved him, that would be able to sit and mind the word, I miss that. I miss that. As much as it took forever and I would moan and say, get finished now. And I would say, it's, he's like a pilot trying to find the landing strip when he teaches. And he says, I'm coming to close now. And he goes for another 15 minutes. And by the time we get home, I was in a bad mood. You don't see your faults until you're no longer in a marriage. <laughs> 
There's a lot of things. Lionel was the most patient man. Most patient. And he didn't attack or have an opinion on everything. He didn't. He would let the thing ride in God's grace until he felt it was necessary to maybe say something. I remember one of our lady leaders, they were a leading couple and her husband passed away and this beautiful lady, friend of mine, she came up the stairs and she looked quite depleted after also nursing her husband for three years. And she said, what do I do with my life? And just like that, Lionel said, we're on a trip to England, come with us. Just come with us. And that was it. There was no discussion. We didn't pray about it. She went home, she packed her case. And off we went. Change of scenery, mixing with other people, ministering, finding herself again. Unusual. He didn't say take two years out. His model of mourning was amazing. Press back into God. Get up. Let the Holy Spirit fill you. He is the comforter. And so don't fear the process of what the church is going through. That's what I want to say. Nelson Mandela was in prison for 27 years as Joseph was in prison. So Nelson Mandela was in prison. And there is a, um, there is a process. It's called promise, process, position. Promise, process, position. Who God is positioned, I don't fight with them. <laughs> mm. So people around you may try to get you down, but they can't take your dream. They can't take your dream. At the end of the day, oh, let me go back to personality. So there's a problem in the church all the peter personalities are going what's wrong with the leaders what's wrong with them when are they going to address this thing when are they going to address this thing Th this must be sorted out this is not godly leadership but if they have a john personality and you deal with it because you have a peter personality they say that was very harsh what happened to love what happened to faithfulness what happened to long suffering what happened to the scripture that says, restore that one quickly, lest they die of a broken heart? You will not please everybody all of the time. You will please somebody, some of them, some of the time. Paul type personality leader, which is very definitely apostolic, is running Bible school, training base, program base, alpha course, membership courses, missions course, they can't help themselves because that is their uh, gifting. Personality comes in the package with gifting. You are gifted with a particular type of personality. There's not a second one like you. But don't use your personality type to judge somebody. Lionel used to always say, you're entitled to opinion, any opinion, but you've got to own your opinion. You cannot take your opinion and try and make it somebody, somebody else has to take your opinion. We all as a family bring our opinion. And at the end of the day, that father, particularly that father, just brings peace and settling. And you go, well, it took us three hours from this side to that side. But at the end of the day, what did father say? Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> Joe says, I'm the Peter. So you're the one that arranges the picnic. And, you know, The Five Love Languages is a beautiful book. A beautiful book. When we first got married, um, um, I'm the more spontaneous one. I'm used to arranging things because of my upbringing, standing, helping my sister above, my brother below. 
uh, went to work at the age of 16, worked in a corporate environment. My parents would say, while you're at work, could you phone the, the doctor, do this, do that, do that. I had a sleepy little fish hook, you know, I was in the city. And so I, I um, even though I often say um, I don't like confrontation, that's true. But I had leadership qualities. Um, if I, in sharing this morning, I realized I did have very strong leadership qualities that I've almost denied. But um, so when we got married, Lionel was an introvert, a classically introverted extrovert, and I was more extrovert, although I have a very definite introvert side as well. And uh, we would go to these marriage courses in a big church that we belonged to, that was the church at the time. And, um, and the pastor and his wife had a wonderful relationship and they would share from the pulpit together in talking about marriage. And then the husband, his name, it was Neville and Wendy MacDonald. And, and Neville would say, guys, you got to bring her flowers this week. Come on, guys. You know, we're talking on marriage and da 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 da. Encourage you to, this week, like your homework almost, buy her flowers. And every day I waited for my flowers and my best friend got flowers and I didn't. And I had such an argument with Lionel, such an argument, because I was now hurt and rejected and heartbroken because he would not buy me those flowers. Even when I said to him, but why wouldn't you? He said, because marriage isn't formed on somebody's prescription. He said, look, at, I buy you gifts all the time. So now because that man said, do it this week, he was unmoved. And I realized that in marriage and in churches, because both are covenants, that we set ourselves up for unmet expectations. I expected that response. And Lionel is not a kind of person that is moved by that kind of thing. He's such a giver, but he doesn't need somebody to tell him because he felt it was not sincere because everybody had to go out and buy flowers. And so I quickly learned the difference of personality that if I wanted, because um, Lionel was very romantic, but he was not an initiator. He was not going to bring home the tickets and say, guess what, we're going to a movie tonight. He was not going to come home and say, pack, 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 we're going to stay in Stellenbosch for the night. That's me. It's very spontaneous. Sitting here now and suddenly think, right, cook chicken uh, from Woolworth, some rolls, take the kids for a drive and we're going to stop at Scarborough, watch the sea and eat our... And so I had to get over myself of expecting this is how a man is. And this is what he should do. And therefore, I'll just sit here and wait. Well, I would still be waiting because of personality type. And the same with the giftings and the callings in the body of Christ. So people say, oh, the prophets, they're so rude. No, they're not rude. They are forthright, but they're not meant to be rude. And if they are rude, they need to look at their, how to taper that with grace. The apostles... They are just a bunch of bullies. Well, they need to grow in grace because they're not meant to be a bunch of bullies. They're meant to lead in a fatherly manner. And so God has shut the door. And I want to tell you something. That yes, maybe it is coronavirus. But do you think that the whole world will be hoodwinked by what is going down? Do you know that at least 60,000 people die every year of influenza, of flu? And if you look at the track record, they said swine flu was going to take out how many thousand and all these different flus, and they didn't get to those numbers at all. That the real agenda behind this is going to be forced vaccination. So you can look at world history or you can look at God's history. In world history, 
All the people drowned in the days of Noah. What a catastrophe. Maybe they thought it was a conspiracy. But the real history was one man heard God, got them into the ark, and God closed the door. Coronavirus is a written history, but God has closed the door. Talking about the door, my door is closed and my dog's trying to come in. So we'll just take the camera with us and get her inside. Come, Lulu, in you come. While we are moving around, I will quickly, oops, maybe knock the thing over, um, show you the painting I did yesterday evening. And so it's a lot more waves and more boisterous. And um, I want you to know that I was looking in the Funda Mabers book on dreams. Um, this is probably the only book on dreams that I would consult because it's so scripturally based. And I was looking up something for my daughter-in-law, she asked me. And uh, while I was there, I looked at... Uh, waves and it's so interesting it says waves that are painted from the left to the right um, and i never knew this eh? uh, indicates a uh, revival and i go and i look i've got one two three four five they're either straight on well two of them are still there's no wave just still see but the wave ones are all from the left to the right and they say the waves from the left to the right is revival and waves from the right to the left is an indication of chaos and watch out for false doctrine <laughs> how incredible is that um it's called dream interpretation by the fundamabers when you can look it up on the internet there's one on colors one on dreams and one on numbers and i don't use them to um to interpret my dreams but when i i get the interpretation from god and i want to see if there's anything that i've missed as i waited on the interpretation i will use it as a measuring and it shows you that it says a pregnant woman means expectation of a new season i'm using this as an example i'm just making it up as i go along then it says the promise of god and it gives you all the scriptures about pregnancy and rebirth and promise and then it always has a caution and and so you can weigh it up it's it, it's nice to use as a measuring tool yeah wave from left to right a move from God in the spirit and means wave is coming of revival. Amazing, amazing. So now, oh yes, I got sidetracked with um, opening the door. So um, God shut the door. And so many people have uh, pushed those buttons. So what now? I said, I don't know. God said the next move is mine. So let us pull together now. Um, and uh, where is that book? Oh my goodness. Oh, here it is. Yesterday, I'm not going to go through all the, the points again. You surely have them written down by now. So yesterday, in the six, uh, ten, nine, and then yesterday, the tenth one, on the apostolic prophetic, was uh, God sets churches in territories as governmental, um, governmental centers, full be with believers. Governmental centers filled with believers. Now, uh, that can be in very many different forms. But what are, uh, so there are going to be churches set over territories as governmental centers. So remember what we said. We are part of the church of Cape Town, South Africa. We are not Baptist, Presbyterian, uh, charismatic, new wave, present truth, um, whatever we call ourselves. We are part of the church of Cape Town. Jesus is coming back for the church in the nations and the nations are blessed through the church and we are that church. 
ecclesia is a better way of calling it because the word church isn't used very often in the New Testament. But ecclesia, I think it's 72 times. And ecclesia means those that have been called out. <laughs> um, so... Shirley says, why did you think of all these points when you wrote them down 10 years ago? Well, you know, because my husband had been, had been running with the apostolic for so many years, and when any apostles came to Cape Town, they were part of, like, Lionel, uh, Dave Ornelas, um, William Bath, who was the Rhema Church of Cape Town, um, and, and, and they were natural, they were, no, they were spiritual fathers in those days. And they would come. And be picked up. You go for it, Avril. She said she had a fraudulent phone call and got, she has to stop her cards. I also got one yesterday. Mine isn't a phone call. Mine is an SMS saying it's some special person that wants to speak to me because of the deceased. Now, if they don't know my name, they don't know my husband's name, and it's some very strange name, there's no ways I'm going to phone them. It's a lot of fraud out there. Okay, so what are these governments, governmental centers? Now, I don't want to use... Oh, Ten years ago, Lionel would be picked up and these apostolic uh, vessels would travel around the peninsula. They would come even from Pretoria and Durban and they would pray. They would all get in a combi. They would go to Mitchell's Plain. They would go to Retreat. They would go to Simonstown. They would go to Ocean View. And they would travel around and pray over the region. It, uh, I remember the, the station strangler was a, a person that strangled lots of women on the, play, on the platforms, in, on, on railway stations. And so they called him the station strangler because he had a whole record of these. And I remember the Apostolic Fathers going down to the Cape Flats and praying that this will be the last, because it had just hit the paper, however many uh, added to the record of women that were, it was called the Station Strangler. That's right, the Station Strangler. And they closed that thing, and that was the last time it ever happened. Understand the weight of agreement and call and unity. If one puts a thousand to ten thousand, isn't that amazing? But I believe that the church is coming to a place where all our arrows are going to go in the same direction, regardless of personality. Some will be overly zealous and open their mouth to change feet and others will be touchy-feely and we just want to make sure we keep all the little sheep together and don't let anybody get left behind and don't go too fast and all black poor but what does the word say and we're going to write six manuals on it before we do it and uh, and so don't use your personality to try and convince somebody use the word of God this is what the word says now how do we apply it and so we'll see these, uh, I don't want to say buildings or centers, we'll see hubs of people in these giftings uh, that over regions, over regions. We're not going to have everybody has a father. We have a father. And then spiritual fathers, when they say, but who said that? Oh, um, I'm using this as an example, okay? Oh, Chuck Pierce. Oh, well, he's reliable. Not my this father down there, and but there will be a there will be a groundswell of honor for those that God is placing in this end time time. We are all placed. Firehouses, that's the word I was looking for. And what are these firehouses called to do? We are called to occupy. Jesus says, when I come back, will I find faith on the earth? We will occupy, we will influence, and we will manifest the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. So that was yesterday's point, and I'm adding this one now in closing. Um, right, we need the church of Jesus must come to a place that realizing that we need an apostolic grace to break through resistance and opposition. 
So we embrace this apostolic grace, knowing that the apostolic grace coupled with the prophetic, the prophets will see, the prophets will speak, and the apostolic anointing of grace will bring us into that actual realization and manifestation. Okay. So, Father, we thank you for what we have chewed on today as an online ministry. I pray, Father, that your word will go out to the left, the right, in front and behind for anybody that needs to hear it. So that together, together, we come to a place in its various forms and manifestation that as you have shut the door on the religious systems, that we are standing, even as they stood at Passover waiting, even as they waited in the upper room for the Holy Spirit, even as they burst out into the streets. We ask you, Father, to take off the many, many layers that we have allowed, like a vine to grow over us, like an alien vine to, that takes over the front of a beautiful facade of a building. And in the same way, the scaffolding has become bigger than uh, more, more honored. The scaffolding has become more honored, honored than the building. And so we thank you, Father, that we come back to the place of a face and we thank you for the heart issue bless us this day father as we are so excited for what you are doing and for where we are going leaving behind what is behind we stretch forward into a, a body of people that will uh, be so vibrant in the gifts and the callings and the fivefold office and we thank you for the apostolic and the prophetic. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a fabulous day. The weather is stunning. And um, see you soon. Well, tomorrow morning, 10 o'clock. Tomorrow morning, back on time, 10 o'clock. God bless you.